Welcome to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen, where we help you navigate the challenges of feeding your family and learn about the role food plays in our health and relationships. Feeding and food relationships can be stressful, confusing, and even destructive. I'm Kristen Saxena, a pediatrician and mother of four who's been researching and sharing what I've learned about feeding for over 10 years. In this podcast, I'll share my experience and expertise to help our kids and ourselves with everyday survival tips for real parents. This podcast is about progress, not perfection. So let's get started. Welcome back to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen. I'm your host, Kristen Saxena. On this episode, we're going to be talking about feeding teens and tweens. So feeding kids does not really get easier as they get older, as much as I would have liked to believe that. But uh, the challenges just get a little bit different. And as much as there's resources out there about how to feed your little kid, I think there's much fewer resources about how to feed your adolescents and teenagers. So I'm very excited about today's guest, Bracca Kopstick. She is a registered dietitian specializing in feeding adolescents. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Bracca. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Hi. Hi. So you are an adolescent dietitian, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, I always feel like adolescence is in people that are, you know, in medicine or in education in all fields. That is one of those age groups. I feel like it's not for everyone <laughs> in the sense that either yeah. you're really attracted to working with the kids in that age group or I feel like some people would avoid it like the plague. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. That's very much the response I get when people hear that I prefer working with these age groups. But I, I really love this age group. I think it's really such a time of potential. Um, they have so much growth ahead of them and like excitement without the cynicism of older adult older teenagehood or adulthood yeah so what um was there anything specific that kind of made you realize that this was the area that you wanted to focus on for your work I think it's probably my own experience growing up um seeing how my experience going through puberty um, with development with food varied very much from some of my friends and classmates, um, how I had a really great um, experience that, you know, as all kids do, I gained weight and I wasn't looking how I had as a younger child. And yet the same food that I had been eating as a kid had been uh, allowed to be eaten that I was still allowed to eat the snacks and the candies and foods like that. Whereas a lot of my friends had to start dieting, uh, whether or not that was told to them or that was some subliminal message they picked up. Um, So seeing how my life really was different from some of my friends and classmates wanted me to give over my experience to more kids once I became a dietitian. That's incredible, because I think maybe that is part of it, too, is that a reason that some of us feel so avoidant of that age group is more so something that's inside of us as we look back to our own experience as adolescents. And a lot of us, that's that's a rough time for most of us in life. Um, yeah. Like you said, just a lot of changes, and it tends to be a time of life when um, you know, changes seem to be at one of their highest point, yet self-confidence seems to be at one of its lowest points. Um, oh, for sure. So it can be a really tough mm-hmm. time, but it sounds like, which is incredible, it sounds like you actually had a pretty positive experience, um, in relatively speaking, in terms of going through those changes. And so is it just like you, your family, you felt like your family approached it well or what really did you attribute sort of your experience being maybe a little bit better than that of what you were seeing in your peers? Yeah, I would definitely say it was my family and just, I guess, intuitively they knew that what I was going through was normal and that dieting didn't need to be a part of my life. Like there was definitely dieting influence from family members um, that could have made its way into to me, and somehow it just didn't happen, which could just be my own genetic makeup, you know, my own 
um, just your personality or your personality. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's incredible. So, I mean, I think that I was really excited for this episode. For me, I have four kids, um, and my oldest is thirteen. Number two is almost 11. So I'm kind of, this is my first personal experience really living in this world of sort of these teen tween eaters. And um, so although I've been able to kind of learn a lot on paper, going through it on your own, like for real in real life is always a little bit different. And I find it so fascinating because um you know, there's so much out there. When you've got little kids, there's so many resources anymore. Like the internet is full of how to feed your little kids and, you know, yummy snacks for toddlers and all of these like cute, adorable ways to feed your kid and tons of advice. Um, you know, most good, some maybe a little rough, but about how to feed younger kids. But I think that there's definitely a relative lack of information and guidance on how to feed how to feed this sort of like adolescent group. And I find that it's actually, you know, a time where as a parent, you start to feel kind of some of those anxieties that you felt when you first started feeding your toddlers. Um, I start to feel them again, but certainly I've learned a lot since then. And I think I've got a better mindset, but I noticed those same kind of feelings coming up mostly just because I think sort of like when, um, you know, kids are younger, they're going through a high growth phase around 18 months to, um, and you start to see like just changes in their, in their eating behaviors. And so mm-hmm. now we start to see that's another age where we're seeing a lot of like high growth and changes in eating behaviors. But now they're making a lot more decisions for themselves. I'm a lot more out of control, probably for better. Um, But I think that the other piece is you start to see things becoming a lot more emotionally complicated maybe than you did when they were young kids. For sure. Yeah. There's that independence that's starting to emerge where parents have less of a say on what goes on in their kids' lives mm-hmm. and their friends have a much bigger impact. And like you're saying, emotionally, that's a big part of it too, that things do become a bigger issue when parents are trying to push on one way of eating and the kids are like, no, I'm not having that. And it becomes an emotional roller coaster and, and a fight. There's a lot more of that fighting. Definitely, but it kind of just always reminds me of sort of the mealtime battles that you would see with younger kids um oh, for sure but it's kind of it's somewhat the same idea in the sense that i feel like adolescence is another time of life where in particular you're really working on gaining your independence um so i think there's a lot of similarities although it, it has a lot different feels i think as a parent yeah i think you're definitely true and i think a lot of the ways that i teach people to deal with feeding their teenagers or their adolescents is fairly similar to dealing with your toddler. Can you walk us a little bit through the basics of the approach that you take with the kids and the families that you work with? Yeah, so one of my big things is about having scheduled meals and snacks. It's trying to avoid that grazing, um, constant snacking. There's so much, so many benefits to having family meals. And I think you've covered this in a past episode. Um, So even beyond that, though, there's that helping kids know that there's times for eating and there's times when we're not eating. And that allows them freedom to do things beyond food, gives them time for their hobbies and other interests. So I'm really big on helping families figure out a meal and snack schedule. Um, and then another thing, and this is to avoid those fights, is to keep food really neutral. Mm-hmm. It's both talking the way we talk about food, um, trying to avoid labels, the good, the bad, the healthy, the unhealthy titles like that, but also about the way we present food at meals and snacks. So trying not to force food onto people, um, avoiding that, you know, just take one bite or you have to eat this before you can eat that, things like that, that avoid that battle and just 
here's the food, everybody. Help yourself take as much as you want of each food. I trust your body. I trust you to know what your body needs most. And um, I guess, how does how do the families that come to you, like what are the worries that they're coming with? And I can see that that might that response might initially create some anxiety for people it does yeah because two things that people are looking for is that they're concerned about what their kids or teens are eating so the amounts of particular foods that they either are or are not eating um and the second concern is about weight so either they're gaining too much weight they feel or they're not gaining enough weight um and how they can alter the types and amounts of food that is being provided and then so your advice when, is to not <laughs> exactly so the first thing is to remind parents that this is a time of growth mm-hmm. that they are that their their adolescent needs to be gaining weight often we don't or our parents don't often recognize that this is normal and they see their child who has until now been really slim and whatever body size they've been and suddenly they're gaining weight and that's very scary to them because they don't realize that that's part of puberty and so so necessary to Mm -hmm. develop into healthy adults so oftentimes just that reassurance that this is what the body needs to be doing is reassuring and and i think that's the first thing that we need to really set the stage with Yes. And I agree. I think that that was, especially um, going through that with my oldest son, I thought it was very helpful, you know, as a pediatrician to really know sort of the normal developmental sequences and to have seen this in several children firsthand before I saw it in my own. But I think it is important for parents to realize that everybody's going to, everybody's body's going to look different as they go through the process. But it's very common, like you said, to have kids that were relatively slim and then sort of in that pre-pubertal stage, it's very common to see kids increasing the amount that they're eating and even putting on what they would say additional weight compared to like kind of maybe what their body used to look like and when Mm. you when you can get your mind wrapped around that as a parent to say well this makes really a lot of sense this is just your child listening to their body because their body knows that they're about to go through a very rapid growth and change phase and it's sort of like kind of like when you're pregnant like your body knows it puts on weight it knows what it's going to be needing to do here in the next few months and so i think so many of us as adults have learned not to trust our bodies that that sometimes gets um you know we kind of displace that onto our own kids and we don't even trust their bodies to be doing what they're supposed to be doing exactly so can you talk to us a little bit about what maybe is developmentally normal eating and growth patterns for kids in this age group so what we see a lot into eating as kids are starting to develop is a higher amount of carbohydrates. It's their preferred source of quick energy. Um, So that's what they're going for, the breads, the crackers, the cookies. Those are just boosts of energy, bursts of energy that their body needs because they have that increased need for calories as their body goes through growth. Um, we also want to be focusing on more fat. Their brains are developing. There's also going to be the hormones that are going to be coming out in mass. So we want to be able to create those hormones with the fat that they're eating. Um, again, and additionally, fat is going to be satiating. So that will help them to stay full. It's got the high calories. So again, really energizing this growth and this development. Um, protein is also important, you know, for all of their growth and also again, the hormones and, um, the organs that are going to be growing as they go through development. Um, so we really want to get some sort of balance of each of those nutrients, macronutrients in their diet, but really the focus is the carbohydrates, uh, for their brain, for their focus, for their energy. And I think that that is maybe particularly hard for parents now as 
whereas sort of in more recent years, you know, everything's become low carb, no carb, and that's a lot of the yeah. messaging that we're seeing. Um, yes. And I think a lot of parents are more sensitive to that, whereas I think of like when I was a, it was like the opposite recommendations when I was like in my teenage years, it was like, you know, low fat everything and so everything was a car yeah. <laughs> so it just goes to yeah. show you how the messaging just changes over the years but I think that that idea is probably part of it is their bodies are naturally craving that and that's really what they need but for some of us it's difficult because you know we've kind of like been a little bit receiving the message that like this is this is not what a healthy diet looks like Exactly. Yeah. The message is definitely lower carbs. I see a lot of kids who are afraid of carbs because that's what they've been hearing, that Mm -hmm. they should be eating more vegetables, more fruits. But, you know, kids can't grow on vegetables and fruits. And they, their body knows, like you said, the body knows what they need. And it is more carbohydrates, more of those easy to digest grains and starches. Mm hmm. Well, and I think that what I loved about kind of hearing your story as a parent is I think that sometimes you feel a little bit at this age, you feel a little bit defeated, I guess. Like on the one sense, it's sort of like, well, when they're little, you get the sense that you can make this big difference in their eating habits. Um, But as they get older, you start to feel like, I think it is what it is a little bit at this point. And Mm -hmm that the media and their peers are going to have way more influence than I ever would. And while I think those things are still huge influences that you can't be denied, but it sounds like for you, it was so important that that your parents at that time and their influence on you was so substantial um, that it really was able to allow you to have even a positive experience despite maybe messaging that you were getting from elsewhere outside your immediate family yeah yeah that's true although i I do have the caveat i was before social media so i didn't have that influence (laughs) that is true and i mean that's a whole nother can of worms and i think um it's hard especially all of us now as parents we didn't necessarily deal with that when we were growing up and the evidence definitely suggests that it's not good for uh you know self-esteem and body image and so it's something to be super sensitive to sort of the the unknown now (laughs) It is. Yeah. And there is so much of a play that it it does have a big role, the social media. Um, But like you just said, the parents, the home does have very large influence as well. And the way that parents talk about food, present food, um, talk about bodies as well Mm -hmm. is very impactful to adolescents, even to teens. There's still looking up to parents as role models even though they're not going to admit it necessarily <laughs> even if it doesn't feel like it <laughs> and if it does exactly even if it doesn't feel like it they still look at you and they're hearing what you're saying it it does i think play a, a bigger role than we think yeah so i was trying to think back and i feel like the first time in my life i remember dieting or thinking about diet like being on a diet I certainly remember like in junior high I don't know what kind of diet I thought I was on I think it was um like I would eat these like frozen vegetables and ranch rice cakes and um clear pepsi if that'll age me right (laughs) but uh not a good but you know I mean that was the first time I remember thinking I was eating this meal to like keep my weight down and the other mm-hmm. memories I totally remember are um, I would get like those 17 magazines. So maybe that was the social media of my day. And right. they would have like diets to follow for energy or for, you know, I don't know, the summer. So they would be like diets. So um, and now thinking back on that, like I think what horrible messaging for teenagers. So can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about the really how detrimental dieting for teens and adolescents can be so dieting yeah dieting is the problem with dieting is because like i said we're teens adolescents they're going through so much growth at this stage um besides for the physical like the obvious um physical changes there's also a lot going on in their bodies with their bones growing and strengthening with their brain development and 
everything that's happening requires nutrition. It requires energy and fuel when they're dieting. So the very first problem with that is that they're not getting enough energy in to fuel that. Um, for example, right now it's uh, Osteoporosis Awareness Month, and that is actually an adolescent disease right. because bones are grown in adolescence. Uh, the damage that is comes years later has been because the bones didn't have a chance to form in their youth. Right. Yeah, I think so, that that is a good point. Like, I don't think people realize that when we have like older ladies that are taking all these supplements to kind of treat their osteoporosis and their osteopenia. I think that's a huge point that I don't think most people re- know that you actually build your bones in this adolescent phase and the rest of life is really just trying to maintain what you built during this phase. Mm-hmm. And so if you're not building your bones properly, I mean, you're already you're already behind the curve. <laughs> Exactly. And there's more things like that. You know, if they're not, if they're not eating well, they are in this active state of restriction, which is what a diet is, then what else is being harmed in their development? What else are they lacking or missing out on? So that's the first thing, um, first problem. But then there's also that relationship with food and with their body that's developing right here and right now. And when they are learning that you need to restrict your food, you need to change your body, your body is not good as it is, this is really setting them up for a lifetime of a negative relationship with their food and with their body. Um, So yeah, it's like, do kids really need to be focusing on this right now? Mm -hmm. There's so many other things that they can be doing. Why do they need to be changing their appearances, changing their food intake. So, I mean, I think a lot of the anxiety of parents comes with what then they foresee as like the outcomes of whatever their nutritional profile is right now. Um, And I think especially, like you said, if the concern is that they're eating um, not enough healthy food or that they're just eating too much, um, I mean, would can you kind of talk about the research on outcomes for for kids if we focus on you know changing their diet trying to control their weight right now versus sort of a more hands-off listen to your body approach so research into dieting in general has shown that it's not a viable method of controlling your weight or improving your health um diets fail our body is trying to keep us safe and nourished when it regains that weight it doesn't like to be in uh, an area of starvation which is what a diet is when you are restricting it's starving it's your body of what it needs so when they say that most diets fail it's because your body is actively keeping you safe so diets don't last in long-term weight loss in general. Um, They don't improve health because weight isn't necessarily a predictor of health. It doesn't tell us about um, your heart, doesn't tell us, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Those are not exclusively weight-based illnesses. So losing weight won't improve somebody's health usually or necessarily it's about changing weight uh, health behaviors Mm -hmm. so when we're thinking about setting up kids and teens for a health for 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 long-term health we want to look at those behaviors rather than on the physical appearance Mm -hmm. their shape and size so health behaviors are yes eating well eating balanced eating um a variety of foods, fruits and vegetables, et cetera, like that. Um, it's also about being active in a way that feels right for the body. It's about sleep. It's about um, your mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is so many health behaviors that go beyond just your appearance and even just beyond what you're eating. Well, I mean, I think that does bring to mind a couple of things because, I mean, some of the things that you've mentioned, certainly like, There's clear uh, associations between some diseases like heart disease, diabetes, um, and 
a person's diet in the sense there's certainly been research now those aren't black and white but we can definitely say you know there's definitely association between this diet versus this diet and your increase or decrease risk of heart disease or diabetes um mm-hmm. so to me another thing that that brings to mind is then you know even if you know, I'm not going to be focused. We're, we're not going to be focused on how we're looking and weight in that way. But in the sense of looking at this age group and just maybe things like picky eating or a not varied diet, um, how do you address those kinds of things? Like, again, we've talked, we talk a lot about, about picky eaters and it's usually these mm-hmm. little kids and, you know, all these fun ways to get them to eat and try new things that, You know, and putting, you know, cutting cheese into little shapes is really not going to make my 13 year old more excited to eat it. Right. So um, and I do think that I I mean, I I think maybe you would agree. I mean, variety is certainly the basis for a nutritious diet um, in the Mm -hmm. sense that if you want to make sure that you're getting all the macro and micronutrients your body needs, you probably can't eat one food and hope to get all those things. Um, So how do you deal with picky eating in these older kids? Yeah. Um, So first off, picky eating, like you're saying, it's not always something that kids grow out of. So um, if your child is going through extreme picky eating, you know, they're very limited in amounts of what they're eating, that might be a problem and, and they might need professional assistance with addressing that. Um, when we're looking at just maybe there, there is a variety that they're eating, but there is less that they are. So not quite a concern. You just wish they would eat more. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, what, I guess, what we'll focus on here. Um, so there are, like you mentioned, those, um, the shapes, maybe not going to help, but I do focus on, I do like to um, focus on exposures. So that can be serving the food that you wish your kid to be eating at meals, but it also includes helping them or having them come grocery shopping with you, um, getting in the kitchen with you and cooking up some foods together, Um, planting a garden, if you're trying to get them to eat more vegetables, having a bit more of a, an exposure experience and, um, you know, that hands on ownership even mm-hmm. of that food from the very beginning of it, um, including your kids in teaching them how to meal prep and create a grocery shopping list. Like you really want to get them involved in the nitty gritty of preparations of food so the first time they're seeing this food is not at the table and you're saying why don't you you know today we're having green beans and they're like what's a green bean i've never seen that in my life giving them opportunities to learn about the food maybe it's even just watching cooking shows together or looking at pictures of the food to they they need to be introduced Mm -hmm. to foods just like their toddlers need to be introduced to foods if you're adolescent your teen is hesitant around the food they also need to be introduced Mm -hmm. well and i i think that my takeaway really from this conversation is really uh a lot of the same things that were true when we were kind of talking about feeding our toddlers and our young kids it's kind of the same stuff right so we've talked about the importance of family meals we've talked about um and i would love to talk about that with you too because i think adolescence is a particularly important time for that but structure feeding and avoiding sort of that grazing pattern um and then just exposures so just sort of these neutral hands on getting kids in the kitchen um, and then just presenting the food in sort of a neutral way and saying here it is you can eat what you want or not what you want and I'm not going to force you but here it is Um, those are the same things that I think we're often preaching with littler kids and so it's kind of encouraging to know that like okay you've, you've been down this road before it's just more of the same except you feel that you're more out of control i guess but really the takeaway was not trying to be in control in the first place but i think you know as they get older you just start to get this sense that like well you know there's not they're they're making a lot more of these decisions on their own now yeah so there will be situations where 
this doesn't exactly work like how they're saying that they're just bigger toddlers or the same <laughs> keys that you the, the same tools you had then work, will work now but in general yes i do think it, it's it's still food they're still your kids we still want to help cultivate that positive relationship with food we want to make it a good experience an enjoyable experience where you're kids no matter how old they are want to be with you in eating a meal where you can have that relationship with them around food in w- without that blow up of emotions of um take one more bite or you need to be doing this that neutral presentation of food is really conducive to helping them eat well and, and feel good about what they're eating and and how they're and, and their bodies too you know that they can feel like you trust them to to eat appropriately for their body's needs i really like the way you put that too i, I hadn't really thought about it that way but i think um i think that that's a great way to discuss it in the sense when they get the sense that you trust them they probably learn to listen and trust themselves a little bit more yeah which which is i think really important because they're getting the independence they will be eventually moving on and eating with their friends or eating in situations where you're not there and they need that they need to know that they can trust their body trust themselves to make the choices that will feel good and do good for them and so we've talked about in previous shows a lot of times about family meals and the importance of family meals and the benefits that they can confer. But would you talk a little bit about what you see as the benefits specific to kids in this age group? One of the things I feel is a bit of a misconception with parents is they think that their kids, their teens, just know how to eat. And they should just have this independence of making great meals for themselves. (laughs) And that's not what I see. I've yet to really experience that. Um, Kids still need, teens still need to see their parents modeling what it means to eat a balanced meal, to eat variety, to enjoy food and have that good relationship with food. So I see family meals as a really important time to do that, where we can present a variety of foods and show your adolescents, your teens, that this is what it looks like to make a meal. This is what it looks like to eat food in an enjoyable manner. That modeling is so important that we often overlook it. Yeah, and even at that age, I think that importance of modeling, it still exists and I think more than we're conscious of a lot of times. Maybe even more so because I think even they're more savvy to the nuances of what you do than even they were when they were younger. Exactly. Okay, so I have, okay, here's here's a situation that I often deal with with my 13 year old. Okay, so he, he has grown a ton in the last year and very typical in this like always hungry. Um, and so a typical scenario, and he's a kid that can, he's cooked, I mean, he doesn't, cook a lot but he's been in the kitchen with me he's cooked stuff he's capable um but he will say you know oh mom I'm hungry and I will say something like well why don't you make yourself a sandwich or go look in the fridge and see if there's something left over something easy and he would rather just go hungry than make himself some food is this a typical thing that you see and so I'm constantly yeah. guilted in like the mom guilt self you know there's the part of me that's like well you must not be that hungry if you're not even willing to make yourself something right. but then there's that like mom guilt part where you're like Ugh, fine I'll go make you something so what would be your advice in terms of how to approach a situation like that yeah so this is something I actually just saw this very recently with a client and I feel like it might be this this almost dichotomy for the teen themselves of they don't know, like they have that independence, but they still want to be a child. Yeah. And they don't really know where they are yet. And 
that comfort of having their mom prepare them food is very strong still sometimes sometimes um so i i think what might be the thing to do is involve them you know say i'll help you make a meal so they get a little bit of that bonding time with you it's not just about the food it's about some connection there too where it's not you're not being their their cook and they're not you know just ordering you around because food is so much about connection Mm -hmm. and it seems like in those types of situations you're child is actively asking for connection but they don't know how to do it and they know that food brings in that nice feeling and they've asked you for something so trying to create more of a relationship beyond just okay here's your food go off and enjoy it it's you know come into the kitchen help me make it let's do it together okay i love yeah i think that's a lot more positive way of looking at it than maybe at first you know where I'm like oh my gosh he's too lazy to feed himself (laughs) oh totally oh for sure but I like that you know when when you say it that way you're like okay I'll help you make your sandwich (laughs) but I think that that's an important point like you said that maybe you know I think there is still that sense of like comfort in being cared for particularly maybe at any age I think even as adults sometimes we can be like oh and mom makes me a sandwich like it's nice <laughs> yeah but so I like that um what about things like um you know I think it's a tricky even when you're really trying to present like a um it'd be as neutral as you can and be very positive and help your kids develop positive body images obviously there's tons and tons of influences um on the way that they're looking at themselves and so What about, um, how do you advise parents in terms of situations where a kid might say, well, I don't want to eat too much of that because I don't want to get fat. Um, I find those kind of conversations just tricky because it's like you, you know, you try to be neutral, but you kind of want to, you want to say all of these things. Like it it brings up, I think, a lot of anxieties for parents too. It's like, oh my gosh, like, do you think you're fat? Do we need to? Um, So how do you advise people Mm -hmm. to kind of approach those kind of conversations even when they themselves are trying to remain as neutral as possible? Yeah, all, yeah, it's a tough question and probably happens a lot younger mm-hmm. than we think um, and definitely will, have, will come up. And I think like what you said there, finding out what that means to them, what is their understanding of fat? What is their fear of fat? Um, because you don't want to just put on your feelings straight on to them. Maybe they just heard the word and it has no meaning to them. Um, and that would be, you know, if you could keep that neutral meaning for them, that would be amazing to not have to have negative emotions around the word. Um, but really looking into what it means to them and then explaining what food does for us, what our body is, why we need to feed our body and that we are gifting our fit with food and and fuel and bodies come in all sizes and shapes being fat is not a negative thing and we don't need to fear bodies of different sizes and shapes and really going with those types of messages where it is still neutral we're still looking at fat as just body diversity and, you know, looking at whatever the kid likes, you know, if they're into dogs, if they're into plants, you know, just like there's dogs coming all sizes and shapes or there's different flowers or trees, you know, everything has different appearances. Humans also come in different sizes and shapes and appearances, and it would be boring if we didn't. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to fear if our body looks different than our friends. And also we need to fuel our body as the way it needs to be fueled. Yeah. I mean, I think those, those conversations are always tricky, like you said, because you're not, it's not always clear exactly like where all of those thoughts and feelings are coming from. And even at young ages, I think they're complicated. Um, you know, yeah. they're just not black and white normally. And so, I mean, I guess my approach has just been like, well, what, you know, 
if it's if you're saying you're not going to eat this whole cake because you don't want to get fat is it are you just questioning are you really even hungry for this I mean like are you just noticing that like is that just a sense of I'm over, I'm eating more than I'm really hungry for and I sometimes I think that maybe you know getting to the underlying like where is that coming from what are the feelings inside of you that are 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 you drawing that conclusion because those things you know if you're noticing like hey I'm full and I'm going to stop eating and then you've already jumped to conclusion that that's you know this is how you're communicating it to me but this is what I'm sensing so I think that for me at least like I said I'm I'm no expert in terms of you know I think that I don't know if anyone knows ever exactly the right things to say um no but I think doing my best to just say well what are you what are you experiencing right now that's making you come to these conclusions because we can talk about that like well if you're done you're done let's be done you know or maybe your body is craving something maybe your body is craving some fruit or some protein and you've you're realizing you've had enough of this um, you know, sugary snack. Uh, maybe yeah. that's what you're sensing, I mean, but it's triggering in your brain. Like, and that's the thing that that's what that will ha- will happen to me if I keep doing exactly. This. Yeah, and, and kind of shutting down that type of talk and turning to actually what is doable within your own life is very important. So it's not that association between eating and becoming fat. So um, what? From your standpoint, what are some red flags that you might see in your child that might um, alert you as a parent that they might be struggling with eating issues, disordered eating, significant body image issues? I would look to the feelings around food. Are there, is your child experiencing negative emotions around eating? Are they feeling shame or guilt from eating certain ways? And, and that, or have they made any changes to the way they're eating to avoid those feelings? Um, are they starting to eat in secret? Do you find that they're um, sneaking food or hiding what they're eating? Another issue. Um, are they avoiding eating in public? Do they not eat with friends? Another issue. Um, even becoming very focused on eating only on on specifically healthy food or starting to be more active like really working out a lot another issue and what do you advise people to generally do as a first step if they're starting to notice you know things like you said like taking things to excess or eating alone or sometimes having a conversation with your kids finding out why they're doing it sometimes your kids won't be able to verbalize it even Mm -hmm. um just you know that makes me uncomfortable or i'm just not able to or just you know very emotional uh, when you address it with them um other times they'll be like you know i saw it on tiktok that i should only be doing this and you know there's a red flag about what your kids watching on tiktok (laughs) um um yeah and then other times you know it's I want to lose weight or I want to fit in with my friends or um, I just think I should be eating healthier. So once you get in, get a bit of a response from them, that's when you want to start getting that their misunderstandings or their beliefs um, checked out or realigned with what is actually going to be beneficial to them sure and I always think too I mean I think parents to trust their intuition and if you're concerned that something's wrong to bring it you know bring it to the attention of like a healthcare professional um yeah, for sure you I always think that you know sometimes we second guess ourselves or think you know I'm, I'm looking too much into it but it never hurts to sort of get that second opinion in there and and make sure that yeah nobody's noticing things that you aren't or that they don't need more significant help than than you realized yeah you know as parents you see your child the most Mm -hmm. you know what when things have changed so definitely your child's best advocate Okay, so getting more into just like the practical day to day, like I said, there's tons of resources about like 
fun ideas for foods to feed your little kids. But, um, you know, I've started to really feel firsthand that there some to, seem to be some foods that seem to be uh, winners for kids in this age group. And I know everybody's different, but do you have any sort of like go-to great breakfast, lunch, snack ideas for kids in this age group um, that kind of like really play to their nutritional needs at this time, but also their preferences? I like to look at food combinations. So not necessarily having to match, kind of take mix and matches of favorite foods. Um, So like taking their preferred starches or their preferred cookies or whatever it is and pairing it with other foods that you have that balanced meal or snack. So, you know, if you've got the cookies, maybe bring in some yogurt, bring in some fruit. Um, If you're adding chips, um, bring in maybe some tuna fish and veggies. Um, So taking one food and like building around it to, like you say, take their preferences and still give them that variety and um, meeting all of their nutritional needs. But then, you know, there's dealing with like school and what can, what resources do they have to keep their food fresh? Are they nut free or can you bring in nuts? So uh, it's, it's a challenge. It does to, get yeah. hard for sure. <laughs> I mean, I think I found even like um, sometimes not being so like, you know, breakfast food doesn't have to be breakfast food. Breakfast food Definitely. can be what we might think of as lunch or dinner type food. Um, you know, those are just kind of like constructs to me. And it's like, you know, you can, those if that's what you prefer and you're just not into eggs or whatever else, you know, kind of our traditional breakfast stuff, I think it's sometimes getting a little bit creative too to say like, just because I said this isn't a normal breakfast food doesn't mean you can't eat it for breakfast. <laughs> Definitely, it's, I totally agree with that. Like that often is has been helpful for some of the kids or teens that I work with. It is just redesigning what is for that meal. Like you know, I don't eat breakfast, but it's like okay, why don't you eat breakfast? Oh, because I don't like sweets. Mm-hmm. And it's like so you know, have a sandwich. Yeah, have pizza. Like there's nothing wrong with that for breakfast. We don't have to stick to these rules or constructs exactly right well you know uh, on that note that actually does bring me to our next segment of our podcast which is ask me anything so we have some questions um from parents and i thought of that because one of those is kind of on that topic so ben says my teenage son will not eat breakfast Uh, Part of me knows I shouldn't worry so much about it, but he has a late lunch at school and no time to snack during the day. He doesn't complain about it, but I worry that he needs fuel to perform his best at school and to optimally nourish his growing body. On the other hand, he's seemingly healthy, growing, and doing well in school. So why do I find myself arguing with him about this every morning? (laughs) Yeah, it's tough, especially, like you say, with those late lunches um and i would try to find something that he can eat Mm -hmm. or drink because yes he does seem like he's thriving and doing fine and he probably believes that he is too but that's a really long time to be going without food and without nourishment and oftentimes we see when people aren't eating in the morning they end up backloading at the end of the day and trying to meet all of their nutritional requirements at nighttime or afternoon when they have that opportunity to eat. So if we can keep the energy or keep the eating uh, scheduled and systematic or sustained, that can really help with our energy levels throughout the day. So if you can find something that your son will eat or drink, um, doesn't have to be something fancy or big or just some amount of nourishment even if it's just like a cup of milk to start off with something with protein and carbohydrates in it to get him started yeah I think I thought this brought I mean this one was kind of close to my own heart in the sense that my oldest son he's you know not usually a breakfast person I think 
part of it is as you get into that age group, uh, you know, for most people, the school, the schedule of school is not necessarily fit sort of the biological clock of a kid that age. So truthfully, their body would rather be asleep usually at the time that we're telling them to do all these things than to eat. And so it's not that atypical, I think, for people at this age group to kind of, I always say their stomach hasn't woke up yet. They're really not Mm -hmm. motivated to eat. They'd really rather go back to bed. So I think part of it is just recognizing like, yes, I understand that this is a normal, natural thing for you right now. Um, Number two, though, as I looked at it was, Ben was kind of a little bit answering his own question in the one sense to say like, I mean, things seem to be going well, so he might be in tune to his needs to some degree in the sense that you're so worried he's not gonna do well in school, he's not gonna grow well, but he does seem to be growing well and he does seem to be doing well in school. So at least reassure yourself that this is not the emergency that it feels like, and I can relate to that feeling too. It feels like that. And then I think the third piece is, like you said, is to just get creative because even though I feel like, um, you know, at that age, they may not be that hungry or excited about eating. They still have those. A lot of kids, I think there's still some foods that like they'll be like, oh, but that that I will eat. Like, you know what I mean? And so for my son, it's been a little bit like, you know, I know like he loves quesadillas. So if I make quesadillas in the morning, he'll probably eat a little bit of that, even though, and not that I'm trying to eat when he's not hungry, but like, I don't force him to eat any of it, but it's like, you start to see like, well, I do see that you, you know, if you're extra motivated because it's something you really like, that tends to get eaten a little bit more. Um, So I think just getting a little bit creative and saying like, all right, well, I, I know that like the old standbys might not be it, but if there's a few things that you'll take a little bit a few bites of before you go, we'll just maybe preference those for the mornings. Yeah. And, and just to comment on what you said about not eating when you're not hungry, it's sometimes we just need that practical eating mm-hmm. where, you know, you've gone however many hours of sleeping. So you haven't been eating for that amount of time and you're going to go another amount of time without eating until your late lunch. Practically speaking, your body does need fuel and even if you're not hungry, this is the only time you have available. So eating, even if you're not hungry, this is still part of healthy eating Mm -hmm. is, is finding those practical times to eat as well. Yeah. And I think maybe just explaining that, you know, just that way to your child is probably the best approach to say like, I know you're not, but this is a really long time for anybody to go. So it's probably a good idea to find something. So on those lines too, um, do you ever get questions about like things like protein shakes or protein bars for kids in that age group? Because I think like that's an easy like um, go-to, I think, for parents sometimes if they're having these kind of anxieties about kids this age and uh, those things are so readily available now. What kind of advice for you ha- do you have for about that? So as a protein supplements in general aren't really necessary for, for kids and teens. They are very easily able to meet their protein requirements through the food that they're eating just in the regular day to day. As a convenience item, like if you're looking for shakes or bars, Again, I don't know that it needs to be a protein bar or shake necessarily, like uh, like a, a smoothie that you're making yourself, putting in peanut butter or yogurt or milk. There's your protein. Like you don't need to also add it in the scoops of, of protein powder into that. Um, a bar, like a granola bar, having it with like a slice of cheese. Again, you're getting your protein in maybe a tastier way even like mm-hmm. some of these protein things are not even that delicious um, <laughs> a lot of times do you worry about yeah. it um you know because as adults a lot of people will use protein shakes and like weight loss and to try to like crowd out their desire to eat other foods like do you worry um that that would have that kind of similar effect in the sense that it's like yeah i got you to eat breakfast and you're full but now you've skipped lunch because this protein shake was kind of designed to make you full. Yeah, 
that can that can happen definitely um I, yeah i don't really recommend protein supplements for for that reason because finding that variety of foods is so much more important mm -hmm. like you know getting in your carbohydrates along with your protein along with your fat along with other foods is is so much better for for teens and tweens mm -hmm. that they don't need to be looking to these supplements or powders perfect uh, that kind of i think brings me to this next question too so this is from ellen uh, this is a kind of long one. I went. I want my 12-year-old daughter to have a better relationship with food and her body than I had or even have today at 42 years old. I understand how presenting food in a neutral way encourages her to tune into her own body. However, I worry that processed foods are designed to trick our minds and bodies into eating more calories and less nutrients than the body is actually craving. I don't want to restrict any foods or make anything off limits. Um, as I know that this is likely to make her want to binge on those foods. When she was younger, it was easier to present her with more whole foods, but now, uh, is there any way to encourage her to eat less processed food in a positive way that isn't potentially harmful to her relationship with food? This is so stressful. <laughs> Which I think just kind of reminded me of that as you talked to the protein, about the protein shakes versus like, hey, I could just make one you know, a shake that's high in protein, but also high in like other nutrients because we're getting that variety. And so I do understand a little bit because I do feel like we're just at a, at a place where, you know, that pro you say that, but that protein shake's already made and I would have to make this smoothie. And so mm -hmm. it's so convenient. There's so much convenient processed food um, when yeah. kind of like you said, maybe the alternative is we could make something ourselves and it would be more more nutrient dense and it would be a more complete meal but at the same time yeah. not wanting to you know say this is off limits or to demonize food choices it's tricky it is tricky and especially because we're looking at adolescents and teens who are able to access food on their own so mm -hmm. if we're not going to be bringing in some of those foods then they can easily get it themselves so we do want to present it to them in a way at home that they know that is okay for them to eat it so that when they go out into the world and they're buying you know let's say their bags of chips they're not going out of control by eating it so the way i approach this is to bring those foods into your home and allow them to be eaten and to allow them to be eaten often and with other foods. So for example, take, for taking those chips, serving those chips with your dinner meal. So the chips have that same emotional or moral feeling as the chicken, the broccoli, the rice, you know, whatever is at your meal. And your daughter learns to accept that food or approach that food in that positive way and doesn't feel that need to overeat the food the next time she has it because she knows it's available she knows that it is a food that is at her home when she wants it when she needs it and it isn't a quote-unquote good or bad food for her it just is food just like any other thing in your home yep I mean, I think it is tricky, like you said, in real life because, but I think keeping in mind that a lot of it stems from our own anxieties as parents, probably more so about ourselves. And I think a lot of that just gets reflected in the way that we approach feeding our kids. And I love that idea. And I think my advice would just be kind of like you said, to just instead of trying to encourage her or discourage her with one food or another is just the modeling like you said and not to forget that that's still very important for our teens and tweens um, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you feel like it's important that you would really love for her to enjoy whole fruits and vegetables, the importance of modeling that behavior, not to overlook it. And then the other thing, like you said, is to just kind of like the little kids, just keep presenting it, keep presenting it as normal parts of 
meals and snacks and it you know really then beyond that probably the more neutral the more hands-off you can be is still in the long run probably going to serve your child well yeah but i do want to highlight that bringing in those foods that you don't want is important too yes so that they can have that neutral relationship with those foods and not binge when it's available for them in other settings excellent point well thank you so much Braca. it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show i know i learned a lot yeah i had a great time here thanks so much yeah and i just appreciate so much you kind of bringing these resources out because like i said i really think it is an area where there's kind of a lack of resources and parents can sometimes feel a little bit adrift so i appreciate the work that you're doing well thank you and yeah, I hope that parents can feel um, more calm around their teens and their tweens and food. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks for tuning in to another episode of Feeding the Family. Be sure and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And we'll see you next week for another great time. 